If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. A long time ago, at a time unknown, in a place that no one has ever seen, somewhere on the subcontinent of India, walked Ganesh, son of Shiva, the god of destruction, with his mother, intending to take a bath in the clear, cool pond in the middle of the jungle. Unbeknownst to Ganesh and his mother, his attackers and enemies waited in the bushes. As the lad entered the pond, his attackers pounced upon him and lopped his head off with the sword. His head disappeared and his mother, in frantic rage, looked about her, spotting an elephant in the distance, came and chopped the head off of that elephant, replacing it on her son. From these humble beginnings would grow Ganesh, the god of insurmountability. Any problem could be overcome by praying to Ganesh, who is now remembered for time immemorial in granite, brass, and golden idols. Krishna, the blue one, the flutist, the eighth incarnation of Vishnu, who had come to the earth at times when religious fervor had faded, coming at a special time to speak with Arjuna to show him the new way to salvation in the epic, the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna and Ganesh are two of the pantheons of Hindu gods. Greetings and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers, and the answer I have for what you've just seen and heard is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 and following, which says, Do I mean then that a sacrifice I offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Well, with that, we open our series on the world religion known as Hinduism. We're going to get into the different aspects of Hinduism, their gods, the history of it, and things of this nature. And we hope uh, it will be an enlightening uh, and informative program for you, a series of shows that uh, will open your eyes to a, a world religion that has uh, many hundreds of millions, if not maybe over a billion adherents, with uh, the influence of uh, the concepts of, of Hinduism being uh, felt here in America as well in, in different philosophies known as like the New Age movement or, or, or so forth. There's many variant forms of this type of religion and uh, the underlying uh, uh, assumptions that go with it, such as karma or reincarnation or other things of that nature. But we'll, we'll save all that for just a moment. With me today in studio, I have two very special guests that uh, are joining me here to uh, help our uh, studio or help our audience out there uh, learn more about this subject and how uh, we as Christians should deal with this, uh, this, this very ancient religion known as Hinduism. And first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce my first guest here, Steve Morrison. S Steve, it's, it's great to have you here, brother. Uh, Steve, you have a, a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Texas. Uh, you have a Master of uh, uh, Science degree in Chemical Engineering from the University of uh, Houston. Boy, I remember those chemical engineers. I, 
I don't know how you were able to stand it all, but <laughs> that's a lot of brain work, brother. But you, you were uh, actively involved with the Austin uh, Chinese Church. Uh, in, it's kind of like a Bible church, you might say. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you've been involved in ministry to cults and, and world religions now for over 14 years. And, uh, and in fact, uh, one of your credits, uh, although it does, it's not uh, really apropos to this uh, particular show we're doing here, but you've even had the honor of teaching a Bible class for a unification church meeting, which uh, if anyone knows the Moonies, uh, that would be quite a, <laughs> I think it was only a one-time deal, one time, though. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, you're also a, a, PhD, a PhD candidate right now in your, in your, uh, your formal studies here at the uh, University of Texas, I believe. So uh, you've had a lot of background in uh, dealing with uh, cults and world religions, and it's just an honor to have you here, brother. Thank you. And uh, our other very special guest is Mark Cass. Mark, uh, you're uh, from San Antonio, Texas, joining us today. Uh, you've got a Bachelor of Science from Creighton University out of, uh, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, is that right? Creighton? That's correct. Creighton uh, University out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a doctorate in law, so you're a, 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 a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, folks, I don't, I don't know if you need help. I don't think lawyers are supposed to advertise on TV, but uh, it, it sure comes in handy when you're dealing in a uh, forensic debate, let's say, on, uh, when it comes to world religions differences between Christianity, Hinduism, or other uh, forms or, uh, of different types of religions you might run into. Uh, you attend uh, Harvest Fellowship in San Antonio. It's sort of like a, a kind of a non-denominational type Bible church organization I itself. You uh, teach apologetics. That's right. Uh, what kind of apologetics do you teach? And uh, give me a little more information on that. Uh, we have a Wednesday night class at Harvest Fellowship and we teach Christian apologetics there, defending the faith, defending the Bible, defending the inerrancy of Scripture. And we've just gone into the cults now, so we're discussing cults and world religions. And I'm also an instructor of apologetics and world religions and cults at International Bible College in San Antonio, Texas. All right, and I understand also that you're not a stranger to doing cable access television. Uh, you've been part of a, uh, a television show, I think, called uh, God's Army? That's correct. It ran weekly. Um, it's running for the past six months anyway. I'm not sure where we're at with it now, but it was an apologetic program in which we were basically defending the faith on several issues, evolution, uh, different world religions, different world views, and basically, again, defending the Bible. And uh, now, as we come to this topic of uh, Hinduism, do you have any personal experience when it comes to this religion of Hinduism? Oh yes, quite a bit, firsthand. Well, uh, my, could you tell our audience about it? <laughs> well, my wife was a, a many generation, as far back as you want to count, Hindu, who converted to Christianity. So she is the lone Christian in her family, and the rest of her family side is all Hindu. And so I've had encounters with many of them, plus uh, also being involved a lot in the Indian communities here in Texas, in San Antonio, in uh, Houston and uh, lots of people that are my clients and coming through the Bible College as well since it's international in scope. So I've had quite a few dealings with people that are of a Hindu background. Uh, I understand also that uh, your mother-in-law happens to be visiting right now. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. And she's, where, where, does, she, where does she call home? Uh, New Delhi, India. New Delhi, India. That's right. And uh, is she a uh, professing Hindu? That's right. And, uh, and she would probably be your classic Indian Hindu as far as the uh, majority of the population is concerned because most of them are not educated to the same degree that we would look at in the United States. Most of them do not have college degrees, etc. You've got a huge population in India and most of them are your traditional Hindus that have picked this all up by word of mouth. I see. Very good. And uh, so here we are, the three of us today, We'll be talking about classic Hinduism and, and the ramifications and all of that, but uh, just to tie this in, uh, just briefly on your mother-in-law again, who, in your opinion, is is representative of a lot of the people in India uh, right. in their belief systems. So as we talk about cla classic Hinduism and the gods and in in the doctrines of Hinduism and stuff, what what I'm getting from what you're saying is that. Uh, it may be similar to a lot of people here in America who profess to be Christians of some sort or another, but they're not all that familiar with, uh, let's say, basic Christian doctrine. 
Uh, in fact, I, I, uh, I just read a, a poll last week in a Christian newspaper called Christian News that reported they did a nationwide poll of people who profess to be born-again Christians. And of this nationwide poll of born-again Christians, somewhere uh, around 30% uh, of these people that claim to be saved, evangelical type born-again Christians, 30% of them said that Jesus had committed sins. <laughs> Uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, that kind of a sh was a shocker to me because you usually think those kind of people wouldn't uh, have such faulty doctrine. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm basically tying this back into, I guess it's like this around the world. I've dealt with a lot of Muslims. They don't really know the Quran that well. Here in America, people don't know the Bible that well, yet they claim they're Christians and things. And so in India, in Hinduism, you get a lot of people that really don't, understand all the ramifications of the religion they profess. And that's correct. It's, and like I'm saying, that's the general population in India, which is going to differ from the Indian population in the United States, because those that are here in the United States are generally professionals or have some sort of degree. Now, that being said, most of them are not scholars in the Hindu religion either, and they will hold to many of the same beliefs that you'll find in the villages and small towns of India. I see. Well, with that uh, stated up front, uh, I'd like to move here for the viewing audience to uh, Steve here for a moment. Steve, uh, the, the viewers here at home are seeing all three of us, the whole, the whole setup here, and they're seeing this map back here of Asia and so forth, Africa and whatever, and then some very color, colorful photographs underneath. And uh, just uh, take a little while here and maybe get into a little of the, the history uh, of Hinduism, maybe where do we find it mainly in the world, and, and just say what uh, you think would be a good opening uh, uh, statement for our viewing audience who have no knowledge <laughs> of this subject. All right, sure. Well, the majority of the around six to eight hundred million Hindus uh, live in India, though so you see Hinduism spread out here, and you see some Hinduism in America. To really understand Hinduism, you need to step back and understand a little bit of history of how it got started. Now, there were five great world, ancient world civilizations <coughs> that all started close to the same time. Most people know about Egypt, uh, which was kind of got civilized around 300 B 3000 BC. And then the Sumerians, which were about 3500 uh, BC. And of course, Abraham came from there. And way over here, there was China, which had written records from about 2000 BC. But another one, that often is not talked so much about, at least in American history books, is the Dravidian culture, which was centered here and kind of spread south through India. And another one that was not really known about until fairly recently uh, was the Aryan civilization. And the Aryan civilization was a little bit east right here. Now, first we'll talk about the Dravidians. The Dravidians were very highly educated. Uh, for their time, they were kind of like the masters of city planning. And they were the only civilization, for example, that had toilets. Okay? And so these people, they weren't the, you know, particularly warlike, though they had some fighting, but they had a pretty high level of, of civilization in all these cities and a fairly peaceful culture. This other civilization, the Aryan civilization over here, was, uh, this is a very dry area, and they were pretty much experts on irrigation. And many of these people, uh, 1500 BC, they migrated en masse for reasons that we don't know, and they conquered India right here. Uh, some, of the, some of them, all of them did not go, though. Some of them stayed behind, and some of them later went into Iran, and some of them later went into, into what's now southern Russia. And anyway, the ones that migrated into India, you can read some about that conquest in the first Hindu scripture called the Rig Veda. And they talked about these uh, towers that they saw that reached up to the skies. And these guys had horses. Well, they had better horses than they had. And they had carts, which were like maybe like four-wheel chariots. And they come, and they basically conquered everything. And Hinduism started as a religion that would keep the light-skinned peoples, that is, the Aryan conquerors, in a, a mastery of control over the dark-skinned, what were called Dasas, which today we, we would call Dravidians. And the very first... Uh, reference that we have to the caste system is actually in the Rig Veda. Uh, in the Rig Veda, uh, in uh, Book 10, Chapter 90, verses 11 and 12, it says, When they divided the man, into how many parts did they apportion him? What do they call his mouth, his two arms and thighs and feet? His mouth became the Brahmin, that is, the, the highest caste, the Brahmin priest. His arms remained to the warriors, Chatiras. His thighs were the people, that is, the Vaisa. And from this feet, the servants, the sudras, were born. 
And so the Rig Veda uh, justifies basically what's apartheid. You know, you thought apartheid was just in South Africa, but by a different name, it was practiced in India with these four major castes. Now, originally they were four, but the castes, they uh, multiplied, and so within the four castes, you have all these subcastes, and that's how you got the caste system, that's how you got many of the trappings of original Hinduism. All right. Mark, do you have anything to add to that? Well, um, along with the caste system, you have to understand, too, how this fit into the religious system of the day. Basically, as uh, Steve already mentioned, the caste system was set up for the express purpose of keeping the Dravidians under the hand of the Brahmins. They wanted to maintain this. So not only could they come in, and it wasn't a system of slavery like we would find here in the United States. This was a religious-based slavery system in which they had specific duties that were set up in each of the castes. So like Steve had mentioned, they cut it up into the bodies. The Brahmins would be the priest caste or the head. They would be the people that would be the next in line to go up into the all or to reach this state of nirvana. Then you would have, as he said, the Kshatriyas, which were the warrior caste, or they were represented by the hands. And thirdly, he mentioned the Vishayas. These were the professionals or the skilled workers. And finally, at the bottom, you had the Shudras or the slaves. And even beneath them, you would have what were called the Harijans, or in street terms today would be called the Bungies. These are the untouchables. These are the people that would go around the countryside basically cleaning up the messes that were made after cows and, and other animals uh, went through the farms. They would do the dirty work. Nobody was to touch these people. In order to work your way into this dharma, or this works-based uh, series of salvation, one had to go through their caste system by performing the duties, and guess who was the one, or the class, that got to assign the duties? The Brahmins, of course, those that were the light-skinned people that were on the top. So we have to understand that a lot of people have heard about the caste system, and today they look at India and say, well, I don't see uh, anybody by the last name of Brahman. As history went on, people that belonged to these different castes had family names. So now, if you want to know what caste the person belongs to, people from India will know by your family name because family names became so incorporated into the caste system. And while Mahatma Gandhi did work to overthrow the caste system in principle and on paper, it's very much alive today in India though not for the same reasons anymore. Now it becomes a matter of discrimination, and it's not so much for doing your dharma or your duty so that you work through your caste and move up in your next life into the next caste. Are there different types of Hinduism? Is there, uh, you know, like here in America, there's all kinds of brands of, uh, you know, of Christianity. Well, is it like that in Hinduism? Is there, is there this brand and that brand, you know, one, one's a special brand and other ones, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you have to say about that, either one of you? Know. What, what, well, uh, talking with a Hindu friend of mine, he basically described Hinduism as an ocean of belief. Or you might think of Hinduism really not as a religion, but as a menagerie of, of different religions that all claim to be the same, that are very different. Uh, you have to look, first of all, at early Hinduism. In early Hinduism, in the Rig Veda, they mention the sacrifice of cattle, of all things. They also uh, mention the horse sacrifice. Uh, they also uh, drank this plant called, uh, uh, juice from this plant called Soma, uh, which was kind of interesting. And, it, it, and there was no mention at all of, of Krishna or uh, many of the modern Hindu gods, and Indra was the supreme god. Later on, it kind of became more philosophical in the time of, of, of the Upanishads, and they talked more... What year are we talking about on the Upanishads? Uh, 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 Upanishads about, oh, 800, 600 B.C. on, on, on and on. Um, and, 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 you, and you mentioned that other chief god before it evolved into something was else. Indra. When was... Uh, do you have an idea when yes, that the, was? The, in the, time? The, the Rig Veda, we don't know exactly when it was written, but you might say, oh, roughly about 1400 B.C. And the other Vedas... Uh, now, they, these were written over hundreds of years. It wasn't like one guy sat down and wrote right. everything. And we don't actually know, know who the authors are. Okay, but the Upanishads kind of said, well, behind all of these many little polytheistic gods, there was, there was this great unknowable kind of Brahman. And it was a very kind of impersonal uh, uh, thing to kind of think about this Brahman. And then later, these other sects uh, kind of spun off that might mention a personality cult almost to Krishna. Uh, with, with the Hare Krishnas and, and reading that through the Bhagavad Gita. And one thing that needs to be said is that uh, many Hindus would not consider Hare Krishnas a part of Hinduism. Now, Hare Krishnas would tell you that they, that they are, and so there's kind of a debate about what's a Hindu, and 
for purposes today, I'll just define a Hindu by simply by somebody who says they're they're a Hindu. So I, I, I won't ju ju jump. It's simple. In, I, I, I won't ju jump in, in the in the middle of that. But realize that that the Hare Krishnas say you shouldn't read any Hindu scripture except for their version uh, or their translation of the Bhagavad Gita. And there are other Hindus who actually say that the Bhagavad Gita is not a Hindu scripture. So when you want to mm -hmm. say this is what all Hindus believe, there's really not a whole lot you, you can say. Well, Mark, why don't you uh, just go ahead and take the uh, reins here and give the audience a uh, definition of reincarnation and what it means in uh, the Hindu life. Well, first of all, we have to go into a little bit of background to understand completely what reincarnation is. In my view, this is one of the most insidious doctrines because it's been twisted around in so many ways to keep so many people captive and is probably the number one reason that uh, India itself, the subcontinent of India, has become so impoverished. But first of all, we have to understand a couple of terms. Reincarnation is a term that is used within the context of the worldview called pantheism, meaning that all is God. So everything is part of God. God is within everything. And in the Hindu theology, the biggest problem that we have is ignorance of the fact that we are actually God. And so in order to break free of what is called the maya, or the illusion that's all around us, everything that we see that's created, every pleasure, every desire that we have that's been created, these are all illusory. They don't really exist. And so what they're doing is they're keeping us trapped from where we should be, which is freeing our soul to again become one with the all. And the only way that we can really become one with the all is to get on this what's called wheel of life, or samsara, which is going around and around, and it's a cycle of rebirths. And through each rebirth, we are brought back to work off what is called karma. Now, it's very important that the audience understand what karma is. Karma, first of all, is an immutable law. Okay? In other words, it cannot change. And under this law, what happens is that whenever we do something that's not right, whenever we do something that's wrong, that's sinful, that's bad, however you wish to term it, we gain almost like a strike against us. And in the cosmic scoreboard of things, we've got this stuff that needs to be cleaned off of us so that we can see through. And this is how I could make a good analogy of it. If you had a window, and you got smoke on the window, and it kept going up onto the window until finally it was all blackened, here you'd have a karma-blackened soul. And the only way to recognize your godhood and realize that you're actually one with the all is to start wiping away the soot that's on that window until you clean the window off again, recognize that you're one with the all, and then you get to hop off of that wheel of reincarnation and become one with the all. Now, something else that needs to be known about karma is that nobody else can work it off for you. In other words, whatever you've done bad in this life will come back to you in the next life in some form of punishment. So, for example, if you've killed somebody in this life, you may come back in the next life as an aborted child. You may come back with a serious disease. You may come back with all kinds of problems, but you will suffer in your next life in whatever form you take. Now, mind you, Western uh, reincarnation and Eastern reincarnation have two different concepts. In Western reincarnation, people don't like the idea of coming back as an animal or a bug. And so, therefore, they will tell you, for example, in Wicca, in the New Age, whatever, that you'll only come back in another body, a human body. In Eastern reincarnation, the uh, soul can come back as a blade of grass, as a flower, as a rock, or whatever. Now recognize that once you've cleaned the window of the soot so that you can see up there, you will become impersonal and unconscious like the all. So the goal is, in each of these cycles of life, to strive toward becoming impersonal and unconscious by wiping away our karma. And then at this point, we can get out of it, realize that we're one with the Godhood, and then we'll get, boof, sucked back up into the all. So that's basically what the concept of reincarnation entails. Okay, so, and this seems, uh, well, gentlemen, what, to me, reincarnation seems to be a rather popular idea in American culture these days. Seems like a uh, rather high percentage of uh, Americans, even, are picking up on this Hindu concept. 
uh, is there? Can you can you describe maybe some of the appeal of this doctrine? What what makes it so appealing? Where even a Western mind here in a different culture can pick up on something that comes from the Far East in a in a Hindu uh, uh, type of situation. Well, I I, th I think that people would like to believe that if they you know mess up their life, be it drugs or or however however that they can always come back and they can always fix it later. So it kind of like, like takes the seriousness out, out of life a little bit. And a lot of times, people, if they want to believe something, then they start to believe, therefore, it must be true, without really logically asking, well, is there really evidence that this is true, or is this one of many, many fairy tales? Mark, how do you respond? I, I've spoken with a number of Hindus and a number of Wiccans and New Agers on this, and I asked them, why is it that they're so into reincarnation? Beyond the fact, of course, that we have no evidence whatsoever, which we'll, of course, talk about later, they have this mentality, just like Steve talked about. If I screw it up once, I get a chance to go back and do it again and get it right the next time. And they'll look at you as a Christian and they'll say, you know, it's so unjust because if in this one lifetime you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to burn forever in hell. And so if I screw it up the first time, I don't get a second chance. With reincarnation, oh, this is such a, a just system. And what they're overlooking are, are a few very flagrant errors, not only in logic, but in believability here. I think what we find in, in, from the Christian perspective is our dependence not on ourselves, but on God, basically through the God-man, Jesus Christ. And uh, this is what puts uh, such a wall between people who believe in reincarnation and those who believe in Orthodox Christianity. There are so many people, and I want you to address this now, that believe you can be a Christian and believe in reincarnation at the same time. Can you, uh, either one of you or both, uh, point out some inconsistencies with this idea? Well, uh, I asked one person who used to believe in reincarnation and became a Christian. I asked them, well, what was it for you that, um, that made you understand reincarnation was false? And his answer was, he just didn't see how it could fit. How do you have reincarnation and resurrection? You have one or the other. You are resurrected in your single you know, uh, body, or you have reincarnation, which, which does not allow for resurrection. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have That's the single most important point. Reincarnation is a direct attack on resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The yeah. resurrection of Jesus Christ and our resurrection in the end. That's right, because it's a totally different salvation system. Yeah. It's totally alien uh, to the Christian concept of, of, yeah. of uh, coming to God. And if someone's looking for an exact verse, you have an exact verse. In Hebrews 9, 27, it is appointed unto man once to die and then face judgment. Okay, so once to die. If the Bible is true, then you, know, you only go around once in life, like the old commercial said. That's right. So you have to understand this whole concept of reincarnation begins and ends in logical fallacy. Because as we looked at Hinduism before, it's very clear that there are no absolutes. We have no absolutes in Hinduism. It's everything is relative. Yet, what do we find? An immutable law of karma, an absolute law of karma in a system where there are no absolutes. Then you figure out what is the whole point of reincarnation when you ask somebody is to get rid of all of the evil that you've done in your life. Well, herein lies another problem. Not only do we have an immutable law in a system of pantheism that says there are no absolutes, which contradicts itself, so now we have two absolutes in a system that has no absolutes, that of the law of karma, and that, of course, of the statement that there are no absolutes. Secondly, everything is an illusion, including evil. So you have an entire salvation system that's based on dealing with evil, which is all an illusion. So your entire system of reincarnation is based on an absolute law in a system of no absolutes to deal with something evil that doesn't even exist. And so we begin at the very foundation of reincarnation with self-refuting logic. And from there, it spawns into a variety of different illogical problems with reincarnation that demonstrate just from a logical point of view that reincarnation is not even valid from a logical standpoint. Well, as
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. To see the one-hour version of this video, go to yahoovideo.com. Type in the name Larry Wessels.